Okay, I think we we might get started and uh, we will continue to let let people in. So uh, I will start with uh, welcoming everyone. I will say good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you, you live. Uh, and very welcome to this first Early Career Researchers Educational Session. We are very excited. Uh, and I'm, my name is Erika. I'm the chair for the Early Career Researchers. And we are very happy to have so many interested people with us here today. Uh, and I will give the word to Inti, who will give us some quick details about the session. and introduce our fantastic presenter. Thank you, Erika. So my name is Inti. I've done most of the communication with Christine uh, for the organization of this session. I would just like to let you know also that the session is being recorded and the recordings will be put on the ACD education website afterwards. So also for those colleagues or friends who were not able to join, they can still uh, watch the session afterwards if they're interested. So Christine is our star of today, and she and her team have done a lot of work in uh, attempting to provide a definition of the concept of participation, as well as exploring the current body of literature on participation and to provide an overview of the term used in different studies and how these should be interpreted. And from this understanding, she and her team have developed the family of participation related constructs of which I assume Christine will tell you more in the coming hour or so. I would also like to emphasize that the session is organized by early career researchers and focuses also on both early career researchers and the EACD community in general. So since the early career researchers focus, please, please, please do not hesitate to ask any question that pops up in your mind. There's no such thing as stupid questions. Not in this session. We would like to have a very informal discussion after Christine's presentation. Um, during the presentation, you will not be able to unmute, but after the presentation, you will. So if you have a question, please uh, show, your, show your, your face, ask us your question, and we are very, very happy to have a very informal chat afterwards. And Christine is also looking forward to, uh, to that question, question round. Um, so I think that's everything that needs to be said. So uh, Christine, thank you very much uh, in advance, and the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Inti, and thank you, Erica. It's um, my great pleasure to to be here and uh, and and to engage in this uh, conversation with you all. I'm hopefully now sharing my screen. I will perhaps pop yes. your faces off the side, and uh, and I um, hope to talk for about forty, maybe forty five minutes. And uh, and if I'm rabbiting on in Australian that means if I'm talking too much, too fast, too silly, please let me know um, and we can pause and, and reset. So this is a topic that's dear to my heart. So I will be able to talk about it a lot. So please feel free to say you need, you need to stop now, please. Okay, as is um, the tradition in Australia, I would like to start with an acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land on which I am today. And this is a photo near to where I live. Um, and this is Wurundjeri lands, and those are the lands that have been traditionally taken care of um, by the Wurundjeri people uh, and the peoples of the Kulin Nations in Victoria. And I pay my respect to the elders, uh, past, present and emerging, who have taken responsibility for the lands and waterways on which we live. So what I thought I would do this afternoon, uh, this morning today, um, is talk about the definition of participation and really situate it within that family of participation related constructs, which uh, Inti has already talked about. I'm going to give a very high level uh, overview of the evidence in support of participation focused practices, talk a little bit about what it takes to translate participation focused evidence to practice, and then maybe our conversation will be mostly about um, using the frameworks uh, to help practice and research. Let me just move that little toolbar as well. Okay. So I guess to start with, um, I'm just going to give you maybe 10 seconds, because 10 seconds will feel like a long time, um, to think about what participation means to you. And I think when I ask this question, when we're all in the same room, it's great to then pause and have a conversation, but we'll, we'll take the conversation at the end of the session. So in particular, what I would like you to do is to think about how you know when partic your participation is going really well for you 
and what are the circumstances that make that go well for you. Um, and also to think about perhaps when participation is not okay, is not a good experience, and again, what are the circumstances that make that not a good experience for you, um, and how you feel about it, but also but both when it is going well and when it's not, but also what, what surrounds that experience. And we can come back to that um, at the end. Okay, so let's leap into some of this content. So I'm starting at a very high level here from the perspective of, I know that you will all be familiar with the World Health Organization and the reference classifications, so ICD-11, the ICF and the ICHI. But I wanna start here because the World Health Influ Organization's influence on what is in focus in healthcare is really crucial. So for example, the World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirm infirmity and I've emphasised the word well-being. Health is also defined as the ability to adapt and manage physical and mental and social challenges throughout life. And a health state is the given state of functioning or a given level of functioning within a domain of the ICF. So those definitions um, I think are important for us and I've emphasised particular words in them because I think those words and those emphases actually speak to the importance of participation as a desired outcome of health and human services. And so what those words mean is that we really need to look beyond what's happening just inside the body when we think about quality health services. So let's jump into the ICF a little bit more. So you're familiar with this as well, I am certain. So it's simply a reminder slide that the ICF is a classification system and a biopsychosocial conceptual framework. And in the framework, you see lots of components and lots of arrows. So the components of functioning and disability include body function and structure, activity and participation, contextual components of environment and personal factors. And then functioning and disability are then hypothesised to occur as a consequence of the, a dynamic interaction amongst or between a health condition and those contextual factors. And that functioning is the positive aspect of that interaction and disability is the negative aspect of that interaction. So we're zeroing in on participation, we're getting there. So the reason though for starting at that kind of high level view is really to remind us of how we got where we are today. And in essence, to in our increasing focus on participation as a construct and an outcome in child onset disability can really be traced to the 2001 publication of the ICF. But importantly, it's not to say we weren't interested in participation before that, because we definitely were. We maybe used slightly different words, um, but we definitely were interested in what people did in daily life. But I think this publication really was a catalyst because it gave us a new vision and it suggested a pathway forward for us. And so that participation definition in the ICF as involvement in a life situation was really important. And it, you know, it was seen as an outcome of that dynamic interaction. But unfortunately, it wasn't quite enough to tell us what to do. So over the years, since 2001, our research has really been focused on participation in childhood disability. And over that time, we saw this steadily increasing confusion in the research literature about exactly what participation was. And I'm really talking through the 2000s and, and the teens, the 2000s, through that, I don't even know how you say that anymore. It used to be, not the 20s, but the, the teens of the 2000s. Anyway, so that work led us to a series of systematic reviews they really aimed to provide some conceptual clarity about the concept of participation because that felt to be quite important if we were really going to do research that helped us how to make things better. So these three papers mapped those efforts and they resulted in a participation framework called the Family of Participation Related Constructs, which Inti's already mentioned. And it also added to the ICF definition of participation with the goal of increasing our clarity about what we were talking about so we could operationalise it both in practice as well as in research. So the participation definition following that body of work is participation is involvement in a life situation, totally consistent with the ICF, but that, we're, that it has two essential elements, attendance and involvement. And by attendance, we mean being there, turning up in the situation, whether it's virtual or actual, 
And that can be considered from the perspective of how often you do it, the range of activities you do, that sort of thing. But also this involvement idea, which is defined as the experience of participation while attending. And from that um, review of language that we did, that came out as being talked about in relation to engagement, persistence, perhaps social connection if other people were there, and how you felt about things. So I think it's quite important if we're going to talk about this family of participation related constructs to sort of unpack it. So I'm going to do that and, and build up the layers. So if we're talking about this related constructs, we start with the environment. And we do that because all participation is situated within an environment. And in this family of related constructs, the environment's defined as the broad, objective, physical and social structures in which we live. Think Europe, think healthcare, think disability policy, the buildings around you, that kind of thing climate. Within our broad environments, we operate in a closer context. And so we use Beata Batorowitz's work here and describe that close setting for an activity as being constructed of place, people, objects, activity and time. So it's the things that are actually being interacted with in the moment. Then we put in participation, which I've already said is comprised of two elements, attendance, being there, and involvement, that, that experience of participation while attending. But the FBRC also describes factors that are within a person and these attributes of the person that they bring to any participation experience. So these are activity competence, which is defined as the ability to execute an activity to an expected standard. Do we have the skills? Sense of self, which includes self-perceptions of confidence, satisfaction, self-determination in relation to that life situation and preferences, which are the interests or activities that hold meaning or are valuable to you. Excuse me. And those person factors are influenced by participation and in turn influence future participation. And they're quite important to participation, but they're not participation in of themselves. So the next thing to say is that there's a person in the model. And the person in the model is there to, to portray the sort of a general self-regulating processes that occur within people. Those are our executive processes that direct and monitor our thinking, our emotions and our actions. And so those shapes in the picture now, or the blobs I call them, um, are the core concepts in the framework. But this framework also thinks about how they're related to each other, because that's what frameworks are. They're about relationships between concepts and constructs. So the FDRC is a transactional framework. So that means we, we are hypothesising that there are exchanges between person and setting um, through the participation experience. So if we think about these arrows in here, we're thinking that between participation um, and activity competence are the processes of acting and learning. So competence is an outcome of actions. So we learn skills over time through participation. And having competences or not having competence are also predictors or enablers of future participation. Between sense of self and participation, we hypothesise those processes of engaging and perceiving. So sense of self evolves as a result of the perceptions of participation experience, your sense of satisfaction or your sense of efficacy in relation to that life situation. We think about those um, transactions between preference and participation. We think about choosing and complying. So people choose a preferred activity or they comply or cope with the choices made by other people, particularly children, um, based on perhaps past experiences or expectations for the future. But there's also those processes between these intrinsic constructs here. So between, um, you know, the individuals experience a, a sense of competence or not in a life situation, and that colours their sense of self as someone who acts in the world to achieve a goal. And so then between sense of self and preference is that act of interpreting. And so we interpret our experiences of participation in relation to that sense of self. And that's what influences our future preferences. So it's both the experience of participation and the interpretation of that experience that your preferences are formed. So we have more arrows. We didn't have enough space on the picture to have just one diagram. So this is a slightly different diagram, but the arrows are there and they're meant to be bi-directional. So we also talk about those interactions between the person and the context through participation. 
And so the environment and context are seen as providing and or regulating opportunities for participation and the individual responds and influences the context and the environment. So both the person is changed but so is the setting and the context in which that participation happens. So in terms of the environment, it's really important also to recognise that there's an actual and a perceived aspect to the environment and context. And Maxwell calls these the five A's. So every life situation that any person turns up in or wants to participate in, we need to think about, is it available? Is it both actually available but also perceived to be available? Is it accessible and is it actually accessible but also perceived to be accessible? And is it affordable? Can, do we have the, the necessary time and energy and resources and maybe money to be able to do that? Because if those three A's are present, then we can attend. But if they're not, then attendance is very difficult. But when you're there, it's actually whether or not that environment is accommodating to what you need to be able to be present and active and involved in that participation experience. And those accommodations have to be acceptable to everybody in the situation. And it's really those last two A's that really influence involvement and the experience of involvement. So that context is really important. So I'll just briefly make a couple of comments about the distinction between the ICF and the family of participation related constructs. So the first thing is to say that participation is separated from the life situation conceptually. So what I mean by that is that participation can be considered in relation to any activity or any life situation. So we're not just participating when we're doing work, we're also participating when we're looking after ourselves at home. Secondly, is to say that participation is distinct from activity competence conceptually. So activity competence, whether you think about that as capacity, capability or performance, are all important in their own right, but they're not the same as participation. And that's a fundamental distinction that's very important. And it's especially important for people who have quite complex impairments, who maybe have severe activity limitations. So they can still be just supported to participate and their participation should not be thought less of or penalised because of their activity limitations. And then third, we would say that change is transactional, and I've already talked about this. So that means that participation, if it's transactional, participation can be viewed as both the means and the ends of an intervention. Well, what do I mean by that? So if we think about participation as the ends, then what we're saying is that our interventions can aim to improve participation outcomes through varied means. So we say that participation attendance and involvement are the desired outcome of our intervention or treatment. And we know that directly intervening at the level of body functions is not effective for changing participation outcomes. So in this slide, I just highlight that more effective interventions are those that target the environment or context or that develop activity competence in context, those that build confidence, autonomy and support the development of preferences are what are going to build capacity in terms of involved, attendance and involvement. When we think about participation as means, what we mean is that participation, attendance and involvement in a life situation is the intervention. And so the outcome then might be something else or indeed future participation. So if we look at those bubbles again, we say that if participation, attendance and involvement are the means, when they use those participation experiences to influence activity competence, sense of self, preferences and their individual's um, context and environments in which they can turn up. And successful participation experiences then support developing preference for a broader range of activities or developing activity competence. And not only that, but it builds future participation. So we would say then in this family of participation related constructs that the blobs or the shapes, the constructs themselves are not as important as the arrows. So really thinking about what those hypothesised transactions are is really important. So those doing words, providing, regulating, responding, influencing, choosing, coping, they're really important because that's where um, I think important work for us to do about understanding how change happens. So they're the entry points for intervention potentially. So that's our challenge I think going forward. So we know that participation is something that is happening at every moment of every day for every person um, and so it's really those transactional exchanges that occur over time over the life course that really matter. And so when we think about that we have to think well 
what, what are we, how are we intervening, how might we measure, what do we need to be measuring. So if we want to measure transactional exchanges, then we need to think about what's being provided, what's being experienced, not only by the individual, but everybody else in the situation. So life is a series of situations, so situational characteristics will influence what people feel and think and do in the moment over time. So those arrows and verbs in the family participation related constructs really talk to us about those um, transactional exchanges that can occur and give us some focal point for moving forward. So that's kind of really unpacked the FPRC for us. I'm just going to jump in for just a couple of minutes around what's the evidence for being participation focused. And so what, what I would like to say is just quickly, we have been building and focusing on this evidence for the last 20 years, 21 years now, on you know patterns of participation, measures of participation, the, what is the construct, um, how do we intervene? And really just at a very quick level, what we've learned is that those patterns of participation really um, confirm for us that young people and uh, children with disability do have significant restrictions in their participation in comparison to their peers across a range of settings and activities. We have a limited amount of evidence around longitudinal outcomes of participation, so what happens over time, um, but that suggests actually participation is relatively stable and that is, a, um, I guess, a bit of a red flag for us to think about what's needed. And we also know that the factors that most influence participation are mostly in the environment. So, so we know those things from a large body of work across diverse fields. When we think about measures, we know that the early measures of participation really confounded measurement of independence or skill development with participation. And so some of our early studies in participation perhaps don't tell us everything we need to know about participation, so we need to be aware there. But we actually do have a range of conceptually grounded and psychometrically sound measures of participation that we can draw. And there's just some examples there um, that, are, that would tap different, different age groups here, different types of measures. We think about the construct, I've just walked you through what we've been doing in our group. So I guess, you know, just to say we now have this definition that has two conceptual components to it of attendance and involvement. If we think about interventions, we know that the research has clearly shown to us that just focusing on changing body structures and alone is not effective to change participation outcomes. It has to be a very big change at the level of body structure and function to change participation outcomes as the sole intervention. But we do know that if we have if interventions that use participation focused goals that be delivered in natural context, that there's coaching and mentoring around people, that we actually look for solutions within context and environments, um, that actually there are some really strong outcomes for participation in young people. And there's a series of names there of types of interventions that have evidence sitting behind them. There's also been quite a lot of work over the last 20 years to support us in implementing participation focused practices. So these these tools like the PEM Plus, so a participation and environment measure care planning intervention. So really designed for working with young people um, and parents to be able to set participation goals. The MAPI, which is a, a method of auditing what we do in practice and checking out, are we participation focused? Oh, I can just see some things popping up in chat. Do I need to pause? Ah, is anybody else having trouble with the screen? Just one person? Okay, I keep going. Um, yeah, and then we have um, SPAN and JUA, which are tools to help you navigate your environment around either um, so how you engage in social participation or indeed finding leisure participation. And then the CMAT book, which is really a tool to support young people to set goals in collaboration with in therapy. So some really nice tools to support us to be participation focused in our implementation. So we have 20 years of participation um, evidence and we know from our knowledge translation re research that sadly it takes about 20 years to implement your evidence into practice, but we would rather go faster than that if we could. We, and we do know that there is a, a no-do gap between what we know and what we do in practice. And, and I think also, what it, I think it's probably less of a gap in research, but sometimes that's still there too. So how do we actually make sure that we're operating on the most current evidence? And when do we have enough evidence to be able to try and shift that no-do gap? And I think we would say that we do have sufficient evidence about 
measures and strategies to improve participation. And now we really need to start doing some of that knowledge translation to get those practices happening on the ground. So as a consequence, there's been an international group of us who've been collaborating together and this paper is relatively new, just came out late last year, um, which is a, a group that um, Dana Annaby and Mary Gatani and Barbara Pisker and Menno van der Holst and Gary Biddle and Frank and, um, and a group of Rune Simeonson and myself have collaborated on to create. But it's been done as part of a our different networks where we tried to bring our knowledge together um, to create this roadmap for translating participation evidence into clinical practice. So it's really the, the goal here with this particular roadmap is to provide um, practitioners with the, the who, what and how of implementing participation focused practices. And I think we would say right at the outset that this roadmap explicitly involves partnering with people with disability and their families, children and young people and our broader communities beyond the healthcare sector to create the environments where inclusion and participation are both expected and possible. So I'm again just going to take a pretty high level quick walk through there through this and then I'm going to give you some resources that you can um, use yourselves if you were interested. So what does this roadmap include? So the first thing it, is, it includes is a, a multi-level framework which is really a bringing together of different frameworks to try and help us get the tools that help us to change practice because we know actually changing practice is not that easy. It also gives us um, eight guiding principles, and I'll, I'll share those with you in a minute, um, and some examples, a suite of examples of implementation strategies, and then the resources, which I'm going to share with you via a link um, to some fillable forms that can guide what you might want to do in your own practice or in your own research. So the framework is this rather fancy figure. And uh, if we just uh, to talk you through it a little bit. Um, so this brings together um, it is really a multi-level um, KT framework. So it illustrates that to really change practice in participation outcomes, that we need to involve um, people and systems at various ecological levels. So it's not enough to just work at the level of child or just child and family. So we really need to be working in collaboration with children, youth and families, of course, um, and ourselves. But also we need to be thinking about what are the organisational structures and contexts. And, and then also what are the policies and regulatory environments in which we're working? Because they all influence what's possible in terms of participation. So that's the first thing to say, it's this ecological framework. The next thing, and, and really those that, that ecological framework is highlighted in the circle here. So, you know, the who, who is involved here is the, the clinician, the professional, the manager, the community leader outside of therapy, outside of the healthcare system, policy makers in government or local, local or federal or beyond government, and of course, young people themselves and family members. And whatever you're trying to do as a participation um, innovation, innovation or participation action, whether it be measurement or intervention, that's that central diamond that flows through everything. And this funny coloured bell thing behind everything is really talking about where is the um, where is the capacity for change within the team within you, which you work or within the setting within which you work? And so this um, cultural cone, if you like, which was developed originally by Bridget O'Connor in, in her PhD work around how do we embed evidence-based assessment in practice, really talked about um, from her evidence how there were therapists were really at this sort of, no, I just don't, I just don't do participation focused practice. It's just not part of what we do. I, I don't know how, I don't have time, I don't have the resources, we don't. I don't. And then, you know, moving up through this sort of behavioural change continuum up to the I can't is there's sort of a recognition that it, maybe it's something that could be done, but I can't do it. It's not for us, it's not for me. I don't have, again, the time, the resources, the capacity, the whatever. And then we have um, situations where there's sort of the, the I try. I have some resources, I have some skills, I have some knowledge. I can do it sometimes when all the stars align, but actually it's not fully embedded in practice. 
And then there's this, this sort of, well, I do, I do, I have it, I know what I'm doing, I have the resources, I have the skills and the, the children and the families that I work with, that's, that's what I do. And then perhaps this we do is that collaborative sense of our organisation, our systems, our structures, our way of working enables um, and facilitates a participation focused practice and that we can use participation focused tools and resources and ways of working and thinking in our practice. So sort of a, a way of thinking about where you're at and what you have to work with. So those frameworks provide us the sort of some of those structural pieces for changing practice. And then we situate around that these eight guiding principles about being participation focused. So the first one is to focus on the essence of participation based practice. So, so actually think about what is it that is the essential pieces of that and to be really clear about those within your own setting. And that means helping you, yeah, helping you and the families and your managers and whoever else you're working with to talk about participation, to embed the language of participation in what you do with the people that you interact with. So it's a, attendance and involvement, it's what, is, what are the, the context, the settings, the tools that are enabling that. We, we know that to support young people to participate in their communities, in their life situations that they want to do, that they actually need a team of people around them. And so do people who are trying to change participation focused practice within their own organisations or ways of work. So build a participation team. So they're your collaborators, partners, champions, stakeholders that actually are also on board with this idea of being participation focused. So, the next thing is to really understand where it sits within your own situation. So it might, it may not be what you can do um, in the in the immediate future, but there may be opportunities for you to look what, at what you can do or which pieces you can um, fit into your situation. Leveraging those existing resources is really about thinking: if I'm going to start doing something new, I have to stop doing something old because actually. It's not that we're sitting around wondering what we should do with our time. We're normally pretty busy people. So what resources are available for this? And, and what can I redirect towards this kind of work if it's what's in focus? The other one is close. The next one is close. So close the research practice research gap. And that is really about maintaining that sort of evidence-based practice flavour and focus. So what are you going to do? Where is the evidence for it? How will you know what you have done has changed something? What are you measuring? How will you embed what you have learned from that into the next go that you do? Connect and share and um, your successes is really about being an advocate saying we tried this and it really didn't work but we think if we did it like this it might work. So how do we do that? How do we share that amongst ourselves? And then ensure sustainability so that we're always looking at how do we keep it going. The other part of this paper is a whole suite of implementation strategies. So this is just a tiny little snippet. So one of the things we wanted to do in the paper was just give a lot of examples about what might be strategies that would help foster change at each of those ecological levels of micro, meso and macro. I'm not going to go through this slide because I'm going to give you a link that's got a lot of those strategies. And the link is here on the slide, which you won't be able to click, but I'm going to put it in the chat when we finish the presentation so that you can. What, happen, what you have in this link is four forms and those forms, the first form is a series of guiding questions that actually just talk you through the process of thinking in our practice, whether it's your research or whether it's your clinical practice, what is the objective of your participation focus change, your innovation, what are you going to do differently? Um, so what's the focus, what's the goal? Um, and, and it's a fillable form so you can start mapping it out within that. What's going to get in the way? What are the barriers? What are the strategies? What are my resources? So that's a sort of, a, I guess, a guided series of questions for you. The second form is really examples. So it really links those principles I've just talked about to what those principles really mean. And then some example strategies that link back to those principles. And again, just giving you a flavour of ideas. You're not going to be able to read this slide. I'm giving you the form in a minute. So I think you know it's really just saying that there are connections there that you can draw on. The fourth, the third form is this framework where you can again fill it in and say, well, this is what we're trying to do. This is our innovation. We want to embed measurement at the participation level. We want to set goals at the participation level. That's what we want to do. So then our objective is that, you know, X proportion of our clients will have at least one well-framed participation focused goal 
I'm making it up, whatever the innovation is for you. Well, then there has to be some sort of evaluation of your readiness to change at the level of yourself, but as also at the level of the team. What, where are you in terms of this being able to do that? And who are your stakeholders across these levels that you can draw on that will need to be brought into the fold, become your champions, or indeed to help understand why it is that you're doing this. And then the fourth form is where you get to build your strategies. So this is um, a form for each of the levels. So I'm just showing you the micro one, but there's one for macro and meso as well. Um, so what are what is your goal and then what are your barriers, what are your supports and which strategies are going to be most effective for you? And there may be ones that we've given you examples of, but there may be other ones that are much more pertinent for your situation. So that's just, a, and again, a way of kind of clustering your thoughts and organising your thoughts. So I've talked about the participation, the family of participation related constructs. I've talked about knowledge translation approaches for practice. And I really just want to give two examples about unpacking the framework um, related to two types of life situations and then, then I'm going to stop, I promise. So the first, um, the first really is to say that mostly when we think about participation focused practices to support children and youth with disability, we're really thinking and talking about their participation in life situations like education, sport, recreation, family life. We're wanting to really enhance their participation in all the things that are important to them. So these two examples are just a little bit different because I think that they give you a chance to think about how that frameworks might help your thinking. So my first example is participation in healthcare. So let's, you know, if you're a physician or a surgeon sitting here where your professional focus is absolutely on the body, you're sitting here going, well, what am I going to do with all this participation focused stuff? Well, the first thing I would say is that actually it's everyone's business to consider how their interventions help or hinder the participation of children and youth and families. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that I believe it's our responsibility to think about healthcare as a life situation. And so my first example is about healthcare as a life situation, which of course for many of us, we want to participate in it as professionals. That's our life situation at healthcare. But it's also a life situation for young people and families with disability who get to participate in probably more than they ever wanted to or planned to. So how do we make it work well? So participation, like every other life situation, um, in healthcare is a life situation with two essential elements, attendance and involvement situated in that family of participation related constructs. So this image shows the person focused transactions in the framework and when we look at the arrows here in relation to healthcare participation we have to ask ourselves what activity competences are being developed through participation in healthcare? How is this child or this parent's sense of self being impacted by their participation in this healthcare encounter? Are they building preferences for choosing future healthcare encounters or not? It's because we need to consider all of these issues because just like all other life situations, their experience of participation in healthcare will leave them either feeling competent or not will build them a sense of efficacy and self-efficacy and self-determination about healthcare into the future and preferences in relation to health care interactions and, exam and um, engagements. I think I would say that children and families who have only a very limited or occasional healthcare encounters will cope with inadequate experiences. But our children with disability and their parents and their siblings have frequent and sustained health contact with healthcare services. And we know that repeated sustained participation that doesn't optimise positive involvement experiences has consequences for health and wellbeing. So it's important. So here's the other picture. So this is not the person focused one, this is the context and environment focused picture. So this is about thinking about our context of health. What are healthcare services that we provide? When we work in disability, we probably make sure that we're available and accessible and accommodating. But people with disability also have to engage in routine healthcare services in the mainstream settings. And so to what extent are they available and accessible and affordable to young people and families where there's disability? And are they accommodating and acceptable? Are those accommodations acceptable? And are they perceived to be acceptable? Remember, this is both actual and perceptions of those aspects. And, and we won't know if we don't ask. 
so we need to ask. My next quick example is participation in research. And again, we're early career researchers in this, we want research as part of our life situation, but we also need to think about how do young people and families participate in our research? And how does our research help optimise the participation of young children and families as collaborators and partners in research? So, is it covered in your work? So in this example, we're thinking about participation in research as a life situation with those same two essential elements of attendance and involvement in that family of participation related constructs. So research, if we think about it as the research cycle, it's about deciding what to do, how to do it, doing it, letting people know the results, knowing what to do next. That's our research cycle. So participation in a research as a life situation then still has those two essential elements of attendance. Is it possible for your community partners to turn up in each of these elements of your research cycle? Is it possible when they've turned up for them to be involved? Are there accommodations and are those accommodations acceptable to everybody? Is it possible for us to do this? And then we have to think actually those participation person focused attributes, right? So when we think about those person attributes, we need to consider those transactional influences because your preferences for being a part of this life situation depend on your experiences when you do participate because it's those transactional influences amongst the personal attributes of ourselves and our partners in the participation experience that contribute and develop that participation experience in an ongoing way. So when we think about research as a life situation that we all want to take part in, we have to think about that context. So to what extent are our research environments available, accessible, affordable, accommodating, acceptable at every stage of the research cycle? So we started with the World Health Organization, then the ICF, then the, I talked very briefly about the FWIS maybe, and then the FPRC, starting to feel like, and then I talked about this transactional framework. So we've really got image soup going on here today. So I apologize for that. Lots of diagrams. But I think the main messages here are that participation is attendance and involvement in life situations that occur in our day-to-day -day lives and that change and develop across the life course. One way or the other, we are pretty much always participating in something. Participation should always be considered within a family of related constructs. The changing participation outcomes for children and youth with disabilities, everyone's business. So we all need to consider who we are, where our spheres of influence are in this participation world, where on the continuum we are in terms of being participation focused in our practices and research so that we actually can contribute to good change. And I would say, leaving you with an image of some of the young people and families that I collaborate with in research, that if we want to shift towards participation focused practices for children, youth and families where there's disability, we have to take that multi-system approach. It it's, needs everybody on board and that we need to form partnerships and work collaboratively with our stakeholders. And so how we think about how we do that is really important. And I think some of these frameworks are helpful for thinking about how to do that. And that young people and their families and the broader community are both key partners, but they're keen partners as well. They want to be part of this journey um, and they have so much to offer. And every research project that I do that involves families and young people is so much better than any project that I do that does not. So I'm going to stop there and open it up for a, a chat. Thank you so much, Christine. Such an informative uh, presentation. It was a pleasure to listen. There were lots of diagrams. That's always nice. <laughs> there are lots of pictures. <laughs> it's a better overview of, uh, of what the content is of the presentation. So I personally liked it. Um, I may have some questions, but I am will perhaps give the floor to the other uh, attendees as well first. So if anyone has a question, I think you can raise your hand. If you scroll down to your screen in reactions, you can raise your hand. So for those who have a question, I see a hand of Miranda. Yes. Um, well, first, thank you for the presentation. It was very nice to see the whole story uh, and such nice presented. 
Um, but I had one question about sound participation. Um, for me, the term sound participation was not clear yet. I know participation, but not what sound participation means. If I, you missed can the, I missed the first, what, what participation, sorry? Sound participation. It was I some of the slides um, that was meant the word sound before participation. Oh, so, I'm, still not getting, I'm still not sorry. really understanding the word. Can you type the word for me so I really get it? Sorry, in the chat. And, or could somebody else say, ask, ask me? Because I think sound participation. Is that, is, I wonder if that's my accent, Miranda? <laughs> no, it was literally uh, written on the slide. Um, uh -huh. So I thought it's maybe a specific uh, type of participation, but it's not, I see, at your reaction. No, no, because I'm kind of going, where have I written that? <laughs> yeah. well, it's, <laughs> it's good that, that I'm not missing something. That is just a very and I'm going to go back and look at my slides and go, I don't yeah. know what I mean, Miranda. <laughs> okay, thank I'm you. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I have put the link um, to the um, Google Drive. Can you let me know that it, somebody let me know that it works for you and I can problem solve it outside the mail. Oh, beautiful, it does work. So that's really just a link to those forms, um, you know, that I was talking about in the KT. Yeah, it does work. Perfect. Um, in the meantime, Christine, I was wondering, um, what what's your view on how the COVID-related measures have influenced participation, uh, primarily perhaps in, in um, the disability practices or in childhood um, healthcare in general? Yeah, I think um, it's been both a, a barrier and an opportunity, hasn't it? And I think it's that's been very dependent on who you are. So I think some of the, some of the opportunities, I think, have been that, um, the whole world is caught up with the fact that you can do a lot of stuff online, okay, that virtual participation and things um, is very doable. And for some of the um, families that we work with and young people that we work with, it's really been an enabler that actually um, our research collaborations are much stronger with young people and families because we don't require them to get in their car and drive to us. We actually collaborate with them online. Um, you know, we don't, they can they can do it from the comfort of their own home. And, and you know, that brings drawbacks for some, but for most that's actually been a real enabler in terms of re research. But also the, the problems have been that isolation has, um, like actual physical isolation has been problematic. And then I think we have many, um, certainly across Australia, but I know across the world, many people who actually don't have access to online resources and cannot get online and cannot connect from a healthcare perspective online. And so while our, I, I can't speak for Europe, but certainly in Australia, our government did put resources in into that space to actually provide families who did not have internet, did not have an iPad or a computer or something in their homes, actually put a lot of resources into trying to build that. It isn't, uh, sufficient for all. We know from our uh, kids with medically complex disability that they chose not to come to hospital for long periods of time because it was, didn't feel like a safe place from a COVID perspective. So we know we're well behind in some of the routine health care that we would have provided for those kids. So there's a lot of kind of catch up health care that's going on. So now that's all of that sort of broad, but I think all of it speaks to the participation element, doesn't it? You're either, what is it that we're wanting to enable? Participation in healthcare, participation in recreation, participation in school. You know, some of the young people with autism found participation in school from home by their computer brilliant. <laughs> you know, much better than having to go to school, thank you very much. Um, and others, it was a disaster. So, you know, it, it's so varied. And I, I, I'm not sure if your experience is similar. Yeah, I think we experience the same variance in how children and patients perceive the, the remote uh, follow up. Um, she may see, I'm sorry, I can't see her pre name, so it's okay. That's okay. That's okay. It's Jill. Sorry. Jill. Um, okay. It's obviously just my Zoom login being uh, anonymous this morning. Um, 
I just had a question around kind of equity and I know some of that is around accessibility etc you touched on it in relation to kind of the digital aspect but you know thinking across kind of social demographic groups and kind of remote populations etc which I know you'll have more experience of in Australia than I do in London but um, how you kind of assure that or enable that equity of access and participation for our children young people and families and any tips on that mm. um. So there's quite a lot in hiding in that word equity, isn't there? So if you think about, you know, the the intersections of um, disadvantage, for want of a better way, you know, so, okay, so a young person has a disability, but they also live in, you know, remote Australia. So we, we have parts of Australia that we call migratory. That's how far away they are from everything. So, you know, it's, you know, then then that's really a serious impediment to going to get a healthcare resource potentially, right? So, so there are those sorts of things. And the internet can help if we can actually enable it there. But um, the other aspects of equity are related to other disadvantages and they can happen downtown. So, you know, that, they can be things related to um, the intersection of your gender identity and disability or the intersection of your socioeconomic status and your disability. And what can I afford to do versus not afford to do? What does my family even know about the things that are available? And I think for me, that's where the, those A's are so critically important in thinking about um, the context of participation, because I might say that actually, but we've got we've got wheelchair basketball just here, but it's not actually affordable in terms of the time, effort, energy, or, or money from a family. Then it might as well not be available. So you know, I think it's the how do we address each of those elements is actually the critical piece here. So I guess what I've been talking about is can we use these frameworks for thinking for help to help us make sure we don't forget some pretty crucial pieces when it comes to equity. Um, and how do we, because they're going to be different. How you address equity in London is going to look different to how I address it here in Melbourne. Some of this will be exactly the same, but, but many will not. And I think one of the things that we want to do with the um, paper, that the translation paper, the KT paper, is actually build an international collaborative. And if you want to be part of that, just email me. So my, I'm not sure for my, I can put my email on the thing, because we're actually trying to connect people People who want to change participation outcomes because actually it's a societal systemic thing that we need to have happen. It's global um, and it's big. It's not a quick fix, but we have to just keep going. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Christine, for your really excellent uh, talk. I think it's uh, you, you showed. Uh, I think especially for this forum, a nice framework. Uh, there were two things. Uh, because uh, when I hear you're uh, making comparisons, so you say, for instance, Australia versus uh, London, but if I'm looking to the people that are attending, for instance, hey, Katrina, we had a discussion in our forum, that, for instance, we had a discussion about participation having work, that in former Soviet countries, work for people with disability is actually not even an option. So I, I think that really the context is, is so, so I would encourage you to, to also include people from that kind of areas because that will make a whole lot of difference in your, uh, in your model. And the, the excellence how, how do you think it would change the model, Jerome? Uh, it will not change the model, but I think the, if, if you look in, 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 for instance, if you uh, post them as, as, as circles, then in certain areas, circles will completely be different because your focus should be, for instance, the environment is, is or the uh, acceptance of disability will be a completely other thing. So your framework is really perfect but, uh, to show that, 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 that it is not, not all equal. So it will be completely different for each area or... Yeah, I completely <laughs> agree with you. And I think one of the things that I probably didn't say out loud, but would say now, is that attendance is a necessary but not sufficient condition for involvement. So that's a bit complicated. But but if you cannot attend, you cannot be involved and you're excluded. You're absolutely excluded. So if you are not allowed to get work because you have a disability, then that's a participation restriction that's complete, right? And then we do a whole lot of work to make being able to turn up at work possible, okay, so some sort of policy change happens or somebody offers you a job and, and so on. So then you're there. But actually what we then find often is that it's pretty tokenistic. 
So, you, so you're there, but you're not really, you're not given work that's actually commensurate to your capacity, or in fact, you're, um, I don't know, you're filing paper clips, whatever it is, you know, but you, you know, you're not really involved in the work environment. Or indeed, you might be involved in the work itself, but excluded from some other aspect, like the social aspects of the work environment, whatever it is. So I think that there are places for us to examine those disparities and to look at those disparities, because I completely agree with you. And I could give you, even inside Australia, uh, very clear examples where, where people with disability are excluded from work. And I, I can tell you now that the statistics in Australia of proportion of uh, young adults with CPU who get employment have not changed in the last 17 years because we've just finished doing the study. That's appalling. So education outcomes have changed, but employment outcomes are still pretty grim. So, uh, you know, we have work to do and it's at every level. Is that it's not only a policy, it's also at who's doing the employing. What do they need to know? Our society actually needs to be comfortable with disability. All of our societies need to be comfortable with disability. Okay, thank you. I, I may have just one more quick question. Um, um, in some of the papers, for instance, uh, from the group of Queensland, they, they put in motivation as a very important factor. And uh, mm -hmm. how do you see that within your model? Because it, 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 well, I think it's a yeah. simple construct, but how do you look at that? And yeah, I think it's, it's a really important, I think motivation is also very, very important. But you think about those um, sense of self constructs. Okay, so what is your internal driver for doing something? And I think in the model, that's that interaction between your sense of self and your preferences, because that's actually what drives your motivation. OK, so it's really that internal piece, that sort of self-regulatory piece that's going on there. And then when you're in the moment and you talk about involvement, what's my experience of involvement? Am I? And I think I asked you to think about this, you know, what does involvement feel like for me? You know, sometimes it's being in flow, right, being lost in the moment. I'm just doing it and I can't even, time just passes. Sometimes it's I'm just having a really fun time or whatever and I'm going to keep on doing the really fun thing. Sometimes it's actually the, actually, I really want to master this and I'm not having fun, but I really want to master it and I'm working really hard at it. So motivation is um, absolutely crucial, but actually how it turns up in terms of participation is incredibly varied. And so I think we need to think about it in a more complicated way than just you need your motivation. Motivation for what? To do what? Under what circumstances? And to really make sure that we don't get stuck on the fun trap in participation because not all participation is fun, nor should it be. And actually really satisfying participation cannot be fun. And, you know, and I think we, we you know, if you think about it, got pop back to Aristotle, you know, we, we think about that sort of eunomonic and the hedonic happiness, you know, so the things that just make you feel good and the things that actually you really want to strive for, they're, they're different drivers. So I, I think it's important, absolutely, um, and to be considered. That's a bit of a long-winded answer, Jerome, but not, yeah, perhaps on the Perfect. line. Thank you very much. I think there are a lot of more hands uh... Perhaps Ekaterina wants to um, comment on the question since you were talking about um, yeah, hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, but first, I want to just apologize. I don't know what's up with my camera. I would like all of you to see me, but unfortunately, the computer is not agreeing with my uh, wishes. Um, <laughs> um, it was a lovely presentation. Thank you so much. Um, uh, in um, in fact, the disparities uh, start far away from participation or <laughs> other, you know, high um, matter things. As Joran said, uh, we have had another uh, working group. So um, uh, here in Moldova, I am from Moldova, who knows yeah. uh, about it's, it's not surprising if you want to, because it's, uh, it's small. Uh, we are proud, but, but small. Uh, so yeah, uh, the problem here is, um, it's about the ICF principles, which are not in place yet. Uh, we are trying to implement them at all levels, let us say, um, including the uh, Ministry of Health, including the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs and um, um, Social Protection. Um, it's um, We are at the very, very start. We are an ex-former um, Soviet Union country, which is uh, probably still in that uh, place. 
Um, we are trying to do our best, however, and the accessibility of the population with disabilities, including, and first of all, children, is very low to the rehabilitation um, services at all, uh, I mean, across the country. It's a different, uh, uh, it's a little bit different here in the capital city. In Kishinev, we have um, some of rehabilitation services and um, the fact that the state cannot provide yet the necessary rehabilitation um, um, services. Unfortunately, the um, uh, private institutions are occurring over the night like mushrooms, you know, after the rain uh, is, uh, and it requires a lot of out-of-pocket money. Anyways, now it's just, I'm just uh, trying to let you know that we are working, we are doing our best and saying that we are, it means people who had the chance to, to study abroad a little bit to see the real uh, how how it should work and uh, nowadays I have right now in front of me I have the rehabilitation in health system systems which is a program um, that was approved by the World Health Organization that should be uh, um, promoted and implemented in all over the countries across at least Europe uh, till 2030. So now we are trying hard to promote this um, guide for action, which is the fourth step. Uh, and um, well, in respect of participation, going back to the presentation, you had a brilliant presentation. It motivates me and us a lot. Uh, however, we have such a long journey ahead of us. <laughs> Yeah, Katerina, I think, you know, it is really different in different places and much, much harder. And you have to start where you are. You know, you can't, yeah. you, you can't go from, from where, you know, from here to here without, you know, the work in between. And, and, you know, the first thing is to work on those, can people turn up in these life situations that are important to be in? And, you know, that attendance piece is the first essential piece. And if you can't turn up, then you can't participate or be involved. So, you know, and I think if you don't, if you have those access barriers that you were talking about, system barriers and the okay. sort of even an understanding and expectation barriers, I think that they're really important. And I think, um, you know, I was thinking about some of the, um, you know, the work when we've talked to people from Africa as well, you know, around what is it in the neighbourhood that's available? Because actually it's starting with the resources that you actually do have and looking at the resources that are there that maybe maybe I don't even think about doing, but actually are really important within the context with, in which you work. So, you know, it's the neighbour, it's the extended family, it's the, you know, the, the local, the, the religious and spiritual situations, you know, settings that actually provide the opportunity to break down some of those participation barriers. So I wish you all the very best because I think it's a hard, you know, it's a hard place to be and start. And I guess I, I called this presentation starting with the end in mind. And I guess that's probably the thing that I would say is that if we think about, you know, where do we want to land? Mm. Um, what can we take advantage of? What's happening in our community right now that gives us a lever, a lever to change one thing, a lever to move in one step in that direction? Um, I think that they're the things that I would encourage thinking about. And I do think in that paper, um, there's a lot of examples that you might be able to draw on, that you might be able to tailor or shift or change. And I also think you will have a lot of strategies that you'll be able to share with other people. So please do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, our piano. Can't see your first name. So. Hi, I've just had to hit me to unmute. <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Um, I just had a couple of things, and again, real apologies. My morning didn't go the way that I intended. <laughs> oh, I sometimes <laughs> I think the first thing is to say that, um, particularly for Ekaterina and uh, allies in um, sort of war-ravaged and really logistically challenging country, one of my favourite things is that uh, this is the mother of invention um and I, I just love that and i think sometimes i being forced into an area makes you come up with far better solutions than if you'd had it kind of laid on um the other thing was about authenticity and lip service i recently <laughs> had an appalling experience with a very large organization who actually my teenage 
he's done his work experience with, who have an amazing sort of front page and vision. And the reality that I experienced was so different. Um, I got uh, so personally affronted by this that I sent them the NICE, which is the National Institute of Clinical Ex Ex UK based guidelines on behaviour change. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> With a page number reference? <laughs> lip service and um, actually putting into practice what you say and how things need to be embedded at uh, every level and when the person who I was dealing with had they unfortunately said I completely understand and I said I can, I can most definitely assure you that you really don't <laughs> so um, just just something about uh, just something about the need to work on all levels um, I think that was that was it just a couple of reflections mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. No, really, I think that authenticity piece is really crucial. And, you know, and I, I you know, my example of, um, you know, participating in research as a, a life situation, I think that's, that is a place where it's very easy um, for people to experience tokenism, you know, to be invited in to, at the last, please would you give the tick of approval to our, our research design and plan and goal and what we're going to do and, you know, have we written it beautifully? Um, you know, that is not uh, engagement in research or involvement in research in, a, in an authentic way. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mar Maria? Do I, do I pronounce it correctly? Yeah. Marie, um, so it's Irish, so everyone struggles with it. <laughs> um, um, thanks for uh, yeah, very thought provoking presentation, Christine. Um, I suppose my question relates to the fact that you know, number one, do we need sort of a tiered approach to participation in terms of how we support children, um, given, I suppose, the depth and breadth of disability and, and of need? And within that, then, is participation and, and the fantastic research that is being done around it, is it sort of in a disability silo as well, um, in the sense that, you know, we'll say, in, in the sense that, you know, we'll say we have, you know, this, this maybe the people that spend most of the time on the ground with, you know, children with additional needs, additional support needs are perhaps teachers, um, you know, support teaching assistants in schools, social care workers, youth workers, community workers, and that like me as an occupational therapist or a researcher, I'm more so there in a consultative basis. Um, but we'll say, how do we bridge that gap where the participation kind of I suppose underpinning theory that's really valuable translates beyond kind of the clinicians and into the everyday lives as well I hope that makes sense yes I think you asked two quite complicated questions I'll see if I can remember the first one the first one was is it is it is it is it developmental or sequential or scaffolded um, I think was your first question is that right something like that um, or, well, or, sorry, so sort of more the tiered, tiered yeah. piece. Tiered. That was the word. So we'll say yeah. that, you know, some children need one to one specialist support to access, you know, participation yeah. versus more. They might need, you know, a specialist group in the community. Other children need less support, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. And, and I, I think that's probably true. Um, but I but I wonder if the. the um, I wonder if whether or not the, the, the level of need for support is going to be based on the level of complexity of disability or in fact on contextual factors. Because I think the more complex the contextual factors for any one child and family, the more support they're probably going to need for a participation engagement. As opposed to, let's assume that all of our young people who have really complex disability, physical or intellectual disability, they need more support than the others. I don't know that that's always true. So I would be wary of making a decision, an assumption about that. Um, but actually, I think it's, it seems completely reasonable to me that more, some people need more support than others. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that it's you should only think about it. And sorry, I, yeah, I, I probably yeah. didn't explain it that yeah. well, I guess. No, I meant, no, but that's yeah. okay. But, I, but the other thing I would say is that some of the research that we're doing around um, uh, supporting the participation of young people with really complex physical disability who will always need support to be able to get their daily routines done, so to get dressed, to go to the toilet, to be fed, to eat, to whatever. 
So those daily transactions that happen or those daily living activities that happen. So the research that Robin Heesh is doing in there has really been valuable to unpack what is the transactional exchange that happens through that and what is the contribution of the child within that process and the contribution of the person who's supporting the achievement of those tasks in that process. And that fits beautifully within this framework um, in terms of being able to understand sort of com context child carer for want of a better word um, in the completion of those and the opportunity to think about that from a participation perspective because actually attendance is not in question there right you can't you have to be there if you're going to go to the toilet you can't be somewhere else you've got to be there but involvement is absolutely on the table Mm -hmm. And then the same for, for getting dressed, the same for having a meal, the same for the, all those other daily living things. And, you know, we have in some of that data collection, you know, young people who are watching their videos of themselves and talking about it and, um, and coming back and going, oh, I look really bored and I'm just waiting for it to be finished. <laughs> so there's sort of this opportunity to kind of be self-aware somehow that what what their what their choices might be in terms of involvement and, and engagement in that process. So I think there's a there are a lot of pieces here that we that we really can think about. I think much much um, more deeply about what's really helpful. I don't know if that helped. No, I didn't answer your second question because I've forgotten. Um, I suppose it was sorry. Sorry, I yeah, <laughs> one for the long-winded questions. But I suppose we'll say you have your your. You know academics and your clinicians in the we'll say healthcare sphere and space on one side and then you have all the other people you know who spend we'll say the other 23 to 22 hours of the day with the person in the other space and if you've one space you recognize participation is important and understand the theory around it and then you have the people who are practicing that and you know we'll say and how do you bridge that gap and translate that understanding to the So other. I think that that's a fundamental message from participation focused uh, research and literature is that mm. it's context based. So if you've got therapy happening over here, it's it's not real life. Mm. Get it into the real life. Get it in where it, where it's actually happening. Uh, you know, it's that you know, and I think when we talk to the young people who collaborate with us in research, adolescents and young adults who collaborate with us in research. They get this, they get this in a heartbeat and, yeah, and they are so relieved that we're talking about that and not yeah. about can you do up your shoes. You know, I think it's the, you know, it is, they get it. Yeah. yeah. So, so get yeah. out in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> Straightforward. Yes, thanks, Christine. Yeah. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Rick Lef? Yes, hello. Um, so, Be very um, patient. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, it was a very interesting um, presentation. Thank you very much. I'm a teacher for special education from Germany. And so I think my question is similar to the one before. So it would be um, like, um, so I'm working, for example, with children with special needs in, in um, like with cerebral palsy. And we're trying to teach them how to sit and stand and walk. So to get more possible participation but um yeah so the the main question is um how is, is there a need for us for for from from our school perspective um to get the link to the medical uh, side i would say and um so is it is it necessary for us to talk to the doctors or uh, vice, uh, vice versa um, to um, promote this participation. Sorry, I'm I'm little. Um, no, I think it's a great. I, no. hope, I hope you understand what I mean. Yeah, I do. Absolutely, I, I, it's such a good question, and and it's so important um, because, you know, I, my husband's an educator, and all his you know research is around sort of designing learning environments that are really enabling of learning engagement, and and I often and we often talk. <laughs> sometimes about our work even. So I think, you know, that um, opportunity to think about these ideas in an educational setting is so crucial because, again, it's a, you know, you, you talk about we're teaching young people to sit and stand and walk so they can participate. And I guess my challenge to you and to everybody is really can you focus on getting the participation happening and actually the walking and talking and sitting will be learnt 
through the participation. Right. So it's a how do we flip what mm -hmm. we're doing, mm -hmm. but not to abandon people, right? Not to kind of go, well, we're just going to put you in the situation and leave you to do it. It's actually how to get focused on participation in school mm -hmm. is not about walking and sitting. It's actually about yeah. learning and socialising and having lunch with your friends. And, you know, it's about those things. And actually it's through those things that those those other skills will be developed because that will be the motivator, that will be the driver. Yeah. But you, I do think that having the support from skilled facilitators there, and that might be your local physiotherapist or your local OT or your local whatever, who can kind of say, this is another way to kind of adapt to this situation and learn this skill in context. So how do you build those partnerships that help you do that? Um, I, I guess it's a it's really easy for me to sit here and say those words. I know that it's very different when you're in the moment and you have a class and you have t students that you are trying to support in those learning moments. But I think the challenge here is about how do we flip our thinking and then do the problem solving collaboratively mm -hmm. about starting with participation to do the other learning. Okay, thank you very much. I'm not sure I really answered your question, but I, yeah. yeah. There's, there's <laughs> one very specific question in the chat from IUC Cooper. Okay. It says, I found that um, in practice that CIP willingness to engage in community sport participation is sometimes rejected as an intervention, as they feel intervention should be delivered in healthcare setting. Do you have any ideas on how to best promote participation and benefits to improve engagement? So you know what I think has gone on, is going on here? I think that we have been so good, and this is the, you know, own it, as therapists and healthcare professionals of telling people that they need their body fixed and so that's actually what everybody's trying to get done. And I think we really are trying to challenge that as a rhetoric, right? So we're saying actually that's not it. Actually what we really want is for people to live a good life. And living a good life is participating in the things that are important and being supported to participate in the things that are important because living your good life allows you to learn the skills that you need to be able to live your good life. And of course, we don't abandon people to that. We put the supports around it. We put the therapies around it. But we think about how do we get that in context? How do we actually um, help people to know that it's we don't have good evidence that there's good translation of skills learned in therapy to the things you need to do in your real life. We don't have great evidence for that. So we need to really challenge that as a, as a way of thinking. And it's, it's on us because I think that's what we teach people. I don't know. If there's some nodding. There might be some head shaking as well. <laughs> Thank you. Erica, did you have another question? Hey, Jess. Maybe the last question, or we're running out of time. If Christina has time, it has time. We can handle all the questions, but we'll see after yeah. the question. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Christine. Um, I have a qu uh, question. I think for us, one of the challenges is to go from focusing a lot on the attendance part uh, yeah. and not so much on the level of involvement. Yeah. Uh, and we are, like in Sweden, we are focusing a lot on of and measuring how many children are attending sports activ activities, for example, but we're not so sure about how involved they actually are. Uh, so I, my question is, how, how do you catch and measure the preferred level of involvement, like both in clinic, but also in research? Yeah. Do you have, yeah. How do you touch that? It's a little bit of the $64 million question, Erica. Um, and I think, um, you know, the, that's okay because we have to tackle it. It's a problem. And all of you early career researchers who'd like something to do, um, you know, measuring involvement is really important. And we, we certainly have, um, you know, our research uh, selected, made sure that we've helped young people make involvement goals and help them to figure out what their goals are for involvement and actually talk about what involvement <laughs> means to them, what what it looks like when it's going well, what it doesn't look, what it looks like when it's not going well. How could I tell that you were not involved? How do you tell that you were not involved? How much involvement is okay? Um, and they and it's very interesting. And one of the workshops that um, Gayla Kilgore and I are going to run at the American Academy in a, a couple of weeks is, is actually around that whole idea of involvement because young people get it they know even you know some of the research we've done with sort of eight-year-olds with autism can talk about their involvement um, and what that means to them it doesn't mean the same thing for every person 
So some for some people involvement is or for some children involvement is about what they're thinking about. For some children what their involvement is actually what they're doing. And for others it's actually how they feel. So you actually need to ask. And for some kids it's really hard because they can't tell you. So then you have to go, well what am I looking for? here um, and who are the close people to this young person that would help me understand what does what do I think is good involvement looks like with my young person the person that I know the best because it's not that straightforward and I think it's really easy for us to get hooked into the idea that paying attention is involvement being focused on the task lots of the um, educational research around engagement is time on task you know looking at the teacher when she's speaking to you uh, that's activity competence from my perspective. Can I do what I'm told? But actually involvement is something else. And it is a bit complicated and it's quite slippery. So yeah, but it can be done. All right, people are running out of time. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps it's been a fun conversation, conversation though, thank you. <laughs> and with uh, Jill's question, which I think is for now the last question for the moment. Um, so my question, I had a question similar to Erica actually about uh, measuring involvement. I'm doing a project at the moment based uh, partnering with parents about parents uh, involvement in rehab and using the prime measures, but involvement's been one of the things that I have kind of struggled to think about kind of measuring if you like, but I'm using the Gillian King prime measures for that. But I just had another question in the context of, you mentioned authenticity earlier, Christine, and that's something that concerns me quite significantly in terms of how you, how I genuinely appreciate the parents who are giving their time to be involved in the research and, and co-designing a program to support them in what we're doing. But I worry that I'm patronizing sometimes and how do you do it so that it doesn't come across that way and kind of I guess any hints and tips around that in terms of when you're partnering with uh, children young people and parents families if you like in in a research context mm. I think um yeah I, I, I completely get it Jill and I think it's you know that sense of um, finding our place in this and I think we often we often step into a new field with a bit of you know enormous amounts of goodwill, um, quite a lot of uncertainty and trepidation and of course we put our foot wrong every now and then. That That's true for everybody and we have to be kind to ourselves um, and I think so that's the first thing and I think you know when, when things go poorly we have to be able to go oh that was a bit yuck um, you know and, and I think owning up to it and the thing that I have learned the most and value the most about the relationships that, that sustained research relationships with people is that actually it's building relationships and, and it's relational what we do and we know how to do you know we we know how to do that and it's really allowing the time for that and respecting what is being contributed means actually valuing that this is a completely other expertise that I am drawing on here um, and I have to make space for it because actually there, otherwise there is, if we have been able to create and do research without making space for that so actually we now have to chuck something else out to make space for this because it is genuinely important to do. And you know that, how do we do that? What's the bit that's going to go that means that we can still get our research done in a really authentic way? And I can tell you that my experience is that sometimes things take longer, always the product is better. And I think always the, the value add for the researchers and for the young people and families who have been able to participate are, are beyond the research but of course it's not for everybody and and you know we, we know that not everybody wants to be a research partner and some people don't want to be fully involved and to be co-designing the whole time some people just want you to tell them the answer and that's fine too you know and I think not all OTs want to be researchers not all you know physicians want to be researchers that's okay it's, it's not everybody has to be it so I, I guess I would just say it's relational and and be, and give it time and respect and Bit of humility, humility maybe, <laughs> that it does go wrong every now and then, definitely. Hmm. Thank oh, you. <laughs> I think uh, now we can uh, all put our hands together for this uh, super interesting session. Thank you, Christine, for your time. Oh, it was good fun. Inside. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for your interesting questions. It was indeed a very, very nice discussion. And um, as Christine said, if you're interested in, in building in the participation guidelines, please get in touch and hopefully she can try and aim to obtain as many participants to uh, introduce Absolutely. the participation and I, guidelines. I just, 
I'm putting the link back into the chat and I'll also put my email. So if people do want to be connected, and I'll try and spell my name right, um, I do want to be connected to that broader network around participation done around a BNI trying to form, then you might not hear from me immediately because I'm about to get on a plane and come to Europe, um, but I will respond <laughs> um, in a little bit, uh, I promise. That's perfect. Thank you so much, all, and um, then... Uh... We'll hopefully see you soon, either real life or in uh, online on an on an yeah, other session great. we may organize. Yeah, yeah. And and if you if you're looking for a participation focused research project, just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Lovely to meet you all. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks, Erica. Thanks, Inti. Thank you. Bye.